Um, you mentioned earlier investing in index funds uh, while being in kind of this culture of stock picking. Uh, maybe talk a little bit about how you think about your portfolio construction today and how you choose to get various exposures, just so as we kind of talk about more of the nuanced financial um, topics, people understand kind of the perspective you're coming from. Yeah, so I've, I've written about this a little bit in, in the past, but my entire net worth is this house, a checking account, and some Vanguard funds, a little bit of Berkshire Hathaway, and that's it. That's, that's everything. And I love that simplicity and I value that simplicity. That's, I, I would not even recommend that that is the, that, that most people or even you know, some people, like that's what works for myself and my wife and my kids. Because to me, the metric that is going to make all the difference in the world for me over my lifetime as an investor, my lifetime as, as a human and as a father and a husband is going to be how long can I remain investing for? And I know that if I dollar cost average into index funds and I leave them alone for 30 or 40 or 50 years, I'm going to hit every one of my financial goals and then some. And therefore, like that's to me, that's everything that checks all the boxes of what I want. I don't aspire to be the world's greatest investor. I, I aspire to be a great writer. That's what's that's what's important to me. But for me to go out and beat the market on averages, you know, this year and maybe I can keep that going for a couple of years, that's just not important to me. But I, I, it is important to a lot of people. And that's why I, I'm not a passive zealot. I'm not one of those people banging the table saying everyone else is a moron who's not doing this. To me, it's just this works for me and everyone's got to find something that works for them. And I want to spend all of my bandwidth thinking about the psychology of money, the psychology of investing, and none of my bandwidth thinking about what, what industry is going to perform well in Q3. That's just not, I don't have any interest in that whatsoever. So to me, it's just kind of like finding your own goals and what works for you. Um, to me, I, I also have, I've just embraced just as part of my personality that I have a lower risk tolerance than a lot of people would for my age and income and net worth. And I, I'm okay with that. I don't try to fight against that or try to, you know, change who I am. It's just, this is who I, this is who I am. Like for most people, or not only about most people, but a lot of people our age, Anthony would be what matters to them is like swinging for the fences, making a lot of money. And what really matters to me more than anything is that I can go to bed every night and look at my wife and look at my children and, and say, you guys are going to be okay. You're, we're, we're, we're all going to be okay. We got whatever happens, we can, we can withstand a category five storm. Like we're going to be okay. That to me is, that's my biggest goal, but I know that's not a lot of people's biggest goal. So I always love the phrase, uh, personal finance is more personal than it is finance. And I think we need to embrace that more in, in, in the financial Twitter communities and whatnot, that there's no one right answer for people. And a lot of the debates that we have about this person thinks X and this person thinks Y, they're actually not debating. They just have completely different goals that lead them to a different area. And they have, they're playing a different game. I think that is a uh, very rational view of the world uh, and one that is missing quite often, especially in, uh, was it 240 characters? Uh, that's right. Hard, that's to, right. Yeah. hard to share that nuance. Um, talk a little bit about, uh, you have relationships with, and, and uh, one of the, the impetus for this question was, uh, you know many of the best investors in the world from a pretty objective, um, just data-driven manner. Uh, many of them are on you know, fin twit on Twitter, uh, and then other relationships that you have. How do you um, kind of gain comfort and, and really have the patience and discipline to do what's kind of best for you when you do have all those relationships? Right. I think a lot of people they kind of fall into. Well, I don't have access. So I couldn't do that anyways. But when right. you do have potential access, how do you still kind of remain disciplined? And, and really, it's kind of a, a more of a uh, how do you control your psychology, right? A, as you uh, have this plan. Well, I, I think I, there's two parts of it. One is. To me, it, there, there's really not a lot of temptation because of what I just said about what is really important to me is just, you know, thinking if I can dollar cost average for 40 years, then every one of my financial goals is going to be met times 10. So for me, there's not a lot of just temptation of like, oh, I can go do that. And to me, the idea of, hey, if I invested in, in better funds, I could earn higher returns this year. To me, I would almost put that in the bucket of, yeah, and if I got a second job, I would I would have more income this year. I, I I almost kind of equate those two. Some people like maybe that's not the best the best analogy, but that's kind of where I put it. It's like I I could earn higher returns investing in other funds, but it would pull me away from things that I really like and from like a, the psychology of thinking about my finances in a way that is really appealing to me, which is super simple, really basic. I have all the numbers in my head because there's only like four assets that I own. In, in everything. It's really, it's really simple for me. And that's just, that's just how I like it. And it, if I can do that and meet all of my goals, 
then why would I want to do something else that's going to be more complicated or more risky? I think maybe that's a big part of this. So if there's one part of my and my wife's personal finances that I'm most proud of, it's that we have gotten the goalpost of financial success to stay pretty stable over time. And I think for a lot of people, the goalpost is always moving. So when they have higher income, better investment returns, they get a big windfall. Like if the goalpost moves in tandem with that, then you, you never feel like you're getting ahead. But for us, like the goalpost has stayed fairly stable. So even though as we have gotten ahead over time, incomes have gone up, the market's done very well. You know, this is the, the worst economic crisis since the Great Depression. And my, my index funds are up like 12% this year. So it's like, if, like, if you can have that and your goalpost stays steady, then to me, like, then the appeal of doing that much better kind of diminishes. Like if I had way higher aspirations back to my, my, when I was 19 and I wanted a Bentley and a house in the Hamptons, if I still had those aspirations, then I would be chasing down my great investing friends to try to get ahead. But since I, I, I don't, um, it's just like what, what I do now checks all the boxes that I need to. Yeah, it's pretty interesting. Like if uh, you almost think of it like a percentage basis, the difference between 120 and 130 percent of your goal, just how much extra effort would it take to to get that extra 10 percent? Seems to uh, almost not be uh, not be worth it in some cases for some people, right? Right. I mean, I'll, I'll give you one example. I won't I won't get into the to, to the details, but we got a a modest financial windfall two years ago. Um, it was, it was, it was meaningful as the percentage of our net worth. Like it was pretty meaningful. And when I told my wife about it, she, she just said, is this going to affect how we live? And I said, no. And she said, she said, uh, I, that's fine. Then I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't, she, 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 she just didn't care. Uh, it was just, it was like nothing. And for, for a lot of people it would be, we got this windfall where we can go buy a bigger house, go for a bit. And for, for her, it was just like, well, if it doesn't change how we live, then who cares? It's just a, it's just a game. It's just a numbers on the board that doesn't. And I, I loved that moment because that was the best indication of like our goalposts have stayed steady in a way that we're totally content with. It's not like we're holding ourselves back and saying we would rather go out and spend our money on this, but because we want to be frugal, we're going we're gonna to deny ourselves that pleasure. If we can actually legitimately remain comfortable with the goalposts where it is, I think that is how you gain actual happiness with your money. Because now everything that we save since we're not spending it on stuff, every dollar that we save is just like a little bit more financial independence that will let us go out and live whatever life we want to live, retire whenever we want to, live wherever we want to. It's just a level of control over our time um, that that is meaningful to us in a way that uh, you know a higher level of material living is not necessarily important to us. Absolutely, and and maybe talk a little bit about um, you spend you know, most of your day, if not all of your day, thinking about financial markets, psychology of money, like things that are related to money, investing and, and markets. Um, how do you and your wife kind of think through financial planning, right? There, there's a bunch of people who've come on the podcast in the past. And uh, one person in a relationship is uh, well versed and, and spends all day and kind of like, the, it's almost like their occupation or, or related activity, uh, the other does not. And so kind of how do how do you think through um, almost this, uh, arbitrage of information, right? It's not even education as much as just like somebody's reading all day about something and somebody's not. So how do you kind of, um, you know, fit that into the model of creating a financial plan, staying disciplined, et cetera, especially maybe even times of chaos as well, like where, where you yeah. just might have, you know, better access to information. So I guess there's two important parts of this. One is that we've been lucky and that's, that's the right word. It is just dumb luck in that my wife and I see completely eye to eye on spending which for a lot of couples, that is, that is not the case. And that's a big, big issue. So um, you know, my, I think my wife and I have been together since maybe she was 19, I was 21, something like that. So a, 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 you know, the, the majority of our adult life and the number of spending disagreements that we've had, like I, I'm sure there've been a couple, but I can't think of any. It's always been really pretty eye to eye. So that's a huge component of our personal finances. The other component is that she is much smarter than me. She has a high school diploma. She she went to high school unlike me. But just like leaving that aside, she's much more analytically intelligent than I am. But she has no interest in our finances whatsoever. To the point where, like once a year, I got to I have to sit her down and like walk her through like our like where we keep everything. But because of that, it's kind of just the level of of trust, I guess. Like I 100% control the financial decisions. No, not because I don't want her input. Of course I do. It's just, she's not interested in that. So I, so I do that on my own. Um, so for, I guess from a planning perspective, our month to month spending has always remained roughly stable. There's not a lot of change. I, I guess we have two kids now. So I guess there's been like an, an uptick due to that, but what we spend money on hasn't changed that much in a long time. 
Um, so after, so there's no like, okay, we're going to spend X and save Y. We spend on whatever we want to, but what, but what we want to spend on is not, a, you know, a, a huge portion of what we take in. So after, after, after we spend whatever we want, then I dollar cost average into index funds, the same amount every month, max out retirement funds. Um, and then, you know, there, there's been some, some differences over time. My wife was working for a long time. Now she's staying at home with our kids. So that income went away. And then we, we just bought this house. So there was a big financial transaction there. So it's not perfectly stable over time. But it's just, I think when you have a, when you have a big gap in between your, your spending and your, when, when you have a high savings rate because you've kept the goalpost, you just have so many options about what you can do with your money, which makes the decisions a lot easier.